This week on Fragments of Silicon, everything is back to normal. Oh wait, April Fools. <laughs> Welcome to another installment of Fragments of Silicon. I'm your host, Adam. Joining me as always is the regular crew. Let's get to the news. Um, not that it's going to be all that different from week to week, because, you know, the overriding news of, you know, all facets of society right now is just the coronavirus. But press on, we must. So, Hetty, why don't you start us off this week? Uh, let's see. Um, over the week, I finally beat, um, uh, my friend Pedro, so that was fun, because I got it in the Humble, the Humble Monthly thing, mm -hmm. so I figured, fuck it, why not just finish it, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and then I'm still playing, um, m the Medieval remake. Finally got past the Asylum, because, oh god, that was a pain in the ass. Mm -hmm. And um, still been doing Final Fantasy fourteen stuff. We're trying to see if we can squeeze in an extra night, depending on how people's schedules are going because of the coronavirus stuff, but that's still up in the air. Right. And, yeah, I haven't really made any game acquisitions so far, for obvious reasons. Also, because my birthday's at the end of the month, so... Mm -hmm. Kind of quiet. So, yeah, I guess next person? Half-Life. Right. <laughs> All right. Twilight? All right. <clears throat> well, yeah, it seems right now uh, things at work have calmed down, though. I wasn't there for today, so I'm not sure how first of the month has been. I just... Stayed home. Well, I went and visited my parents um, for the day, and um, things are all right there. And, uh, but yeah, overall at work, we've um, removed some of the limits on some products, but it might be a matter of time before that changes. Um, they issued uh, a stay-at-home order for your state yet? Um, yeah, they. Um, and right now, it's being encouraged to stay home. Uh, I don't think for sure has said anything about having to stay home yet. But uh, in my county, we haven't got any reports of the virus yet. Though um, two of the next four counties have actually had uh, confirmed cases of the virus. So at the, it's probably a matter of time before we start getting any here. Um, let's see here. What else? Uh, yeah, on the days off, I've stayed home and only go out for essential stuff. And in terms of gaming, I've taken a look at one of um, the games I'll be doing next. And um, I went ahead and bought um, Resident Evil 3 uh, Monday on Steam. And um, that's it for me. All right. Well, Alex, you're up. Uh, well, our uh, governor has set out a uh, remain at home thing starting, I think, tonight. Uh, my job is still exempt as far as any of us know. So um, I'm still planning on doing that. Um, otherwise, pretty much everything else has been canceled just because there's nothing open really i'm not super thrilled about the fact that my birthday is in two weeks and it's going to be in the middle of all this so i don't know maybe we'll postpone doing something for that or i don't know um there have been a few interesting things for april fool's day uh 
Digimon and Metabots uh, on Twitter collaborated with uh, Crossover Art as an April Fool's thing, so that was interesting. Well, then I must have missed that um, one. <laughs> I mean, it was basically Omega Mon as a Metabot and uh, okay, a Digimon that's See? basically like Omega Mon, except one arm is Roku Show and one arm is Meta V. <laughs> um, and uh, I'm not sure exactly how April Fool's it is, but uh, Way Forward put out a uh, game today that uh, seems rather weird, so I picked it up. So we'll see how that is. Yeah, that was the game that they put out uh, last year on the Humble Bundle. They just put it out on the Switch this year. Ah. Yeah. Kind of lazy, if I'm being honest. Yeah, well, it looked interesting, and it was, like, what, $8, so... Fair enough. Anyway, I... Anything uh, other than that, I've been trying to do a little bit better on playing Ring Fit Adventure regularly since I don't have fuck all else to do uh, except uh-huh. for work. Which, unfortunately, is the, like, if I, well, I'm not going to say it's because of work. I'm going to it's it's just as much because I'm having a hard time dragging myself out of bed these days. But anyway, that's about it. Do you suffer from depression? Uh, yeah, I'm on something for it. Mm, that's but I think, uh, to a significant extent, some of this depression is, you know, situation-based rather than just, uh, clinical. No, mm-hmm. I know. We all know. Indeed. Or I should say, it's at, at the very minimum, it's situationally exacerbated, so. Uh-huh. Anyway, anything else? Uh, That's all I got, really. All right, I guess it's my go. I mean, uh, speaking of birthdays, uh, my mother's birthday is in a week or so, like eight days, if I'm remembering correctly. And Mm -hmm. yeah, you know, just kind of the exact same, you know, what uh, not, you know, what do you want to do? It's what can you do? And um, the answer is nothing, because you know, um. Once again, the coronavirus uh, has shut everything down. You know, mm-hmm. fi- you know. Thankfully, finally, officially, sort of. You know, it's a whole thing. We'll talk about it in the post show, but mm-hmm. you know, ultimately settled on getting pizza. <laughs> I mean, you know, she wanted to go to a nice restaurant. That wasn't happening. Mm-hmm. Uh, you you could have maybe gotten takeout from a nice restaurant. May, uh, like maybe, but t- you know, uh, the place we were looking at was too far to justify. Ah. Yeah. Uh, uh. you know. Um. So, yeah. Um. And you know, as far as gaming, uh, been de- uh been dealing with a pre. You know, been playing a pre-release game in other waters. Um, this has been a unique year for narrative experiences, if nothing else. Mm-hmm. Um, more on that on Sunday. Uh, still playing through the Mega Man collection, Mega Man Five. Yeah, like get to six. Just you know, nobody's ever in a rush to play Mega Man Six. <laughs> Indeed. And it's not just that's not a statement of quality. It's just you know by like. But it's like by the time of Mega Man Six, it's like Mega Man Six, ooh, another one. Yeah, at but, that point, it's pretty samey. <laughs> well, the Mega Man NES games were all basically a- almost annual releases, if not outright annual. And the main thing that they were was the 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 gim- biggest gimmick they have is that all of the bosses were fan designed between uh, two and six. Mm-hmm. Right. Anyway. Um... Yeah, and that's about it for my news. So, merrily, we shall roll along to the interview portion of the broadcast. And joining us this week is Corey King of Zenfree, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. You're not, but we know it's we know the people don't pronounce it correctly. <laughs> yeah, uh, Zen, it's Zenfry. It's actually uh, uh, it's a company that I founded with uh, 
well, they're now my wife. They weren't my wife when we founded the company, but uh, my online handle was Zenith. Hers was Friday. So it's kind of the amalgamation of our online handles is what the name of the company is. Yeah, I see. Um, yeah, we'll get more into that in a bit, but how we like to start out is um, by asking you, what got you interested in video games in the first place, both on a personal and a professional level? Okay, well, personal level, it's like interested in video games. I don't know. Like, my, I was a kid and there was a Nintendo around, you know? <laughs> like, um, I, I don't have this, like, defining moment of, like, games i just i mean i remember begging to get, get an n64 one christmas and i had to like sell my sega genesis and everything because my mom didn't think i needed two consoles or whatever but uh i don't i don't have like this specific it was just always something that was in in the repertoire of what i what i did watched movies hung out with friends played video games stayed up late trying to get the couple's mask and majora's mask you know like i have lots of memories like that but there's not like it was just always there and always something i enjoyed in terms of professionally it's um you know I sort of, I like a lots of mediums. I was trained in, in film primarily, uh, and I see my uh, company as primarily like a storytelling company, um, but media agnostic. Like I, we didn't start out this thing. We actually started out making films. I didn't start out saying we're gonna be a game company, but I had an idea for a story that I thought needed to take place in augmented reality. I didn't even know the term augmented reality when I, when I started it, didn't know an engineer. Didn't know anybody to do art. I certainly can't do either of those things. Um, but just was really driven to do this. And this was before Ingress was even like an announced thing. Like we had our first funding before Ingress was announced and we were released before Pokemon Go was out. So this was not like nowadays. Um, but I just had this idea of like, I want to tell stories on the world. And you could do that, I thought, through an iPhone. And that just led me on this journey of doing this big pivot from trying to get funding to make movies to trying to make funding to get games. And we just were more successful in our attempts to get that funded essentially. Um, and, and then since we did it, you know, we've kind of been, been doing it ever since, um, we've, we've done installations for museums and all sorts of different AR things. We even did an app for Kohler, uh, that was an AR app. So we've done all kinds of random stuff with AR since, but making narrative content is, is our passion. We didn't do a good job on that first game of having a good narrative because the technology, you know, the technologies that built it don't even like exist anymore. Like those companies have been acquired or collapsed or whatever. So, it, but we failed to tell a story. And so with the current game we're working on, it was our like basically saying like, okay, the next story is gonna be, the next game's gonna be filled with stories, uh, which is partly why there's the whole taxi motif, but essentially, that's it. And we might go back and make more TV shows someday, or I've always had a desire to make comic books. Um, but games has been doing well for us. We've been doing this for 10 years now. And, um, you know, we have a company of, you know, I think eight people right now, an office and, you know, I was able to buy a house. So it, you know, I'm doing fine with this. I have no real desire to necessarily change. It's just whatever the next idea is. And my next endeavor is really I have a good team now, so I feel like even if I don't make a game, the company will continue to because I have strong people who are passionate about games who will continue on, uh, and I'll maybe manage the next one. I'm not really sure, but um, I love all kinds of stories, and I just try to tell them in the way that's the best for that idea, essentially. Hmm. Like, not the first time we've encountered the, uh, a company like yours on the show. like, um, And... There's a lot to unpack here. Uh, God, I suppose my first question is, um, in terms of how to do narrative in AR, uh, how difficult is that? You know, admittedly, I don't know too much about AR stuff. I mean, I would say, has anybody done it successfully yet? I, I, I yeah. don't know that they have. Um, I, I think... My thing is, and I learned it the hard way by trying to make an AR game, but I kind of think as long as you have to look through this phone that you have to lift up and look around, it's just going to be a tedious thing to try to have some very engaging moment. And I patiently await for glasses that have a good enough resolution and definition to come out that we can actually tell real stories. Uh, uh, so I would say it's, it's brutally difficult um, to tell currently especially to have like that emotional connection that you need for a really good story 
I mean, maybe something can be done there when the HoloLens eventually gets out some decade in the future. Yeah, I mean, I've played around with HoloLenses, and I think I think it will get there. That's the thing. And I kind of think VR lays some of the groundwork, like, um, yeah. in terms of sensors and, and, like, even user experience, like how to use real hands in a digital environment and all that kind of stuff. I think they're not married. They are different. One One sort of takes you away and one transforms your environment. But there is some fundamental things then. I think that they'll, the lessons we learn in, in VR will will seem back into AR when we decide to go back to AR, which I really do. I, I sort of have this weird, I don't even understand it. It's kind of like, you know, when you fall in love, you don't really understand why or what's happening. But like, I have that for AR, I think. It's just some sort of like, it reminds me of how my imagination kind of works, where you just kind of like look in a corner and you can manifest anything. Um, so I, I, I don't know when, but at some point I do hope to go back to air and actually tell a good story. Right. And I suppose um, to deepen the connection here is what kind of story are you trying to tell that could only be done in the medium of augmented reality? Well, with that game, the whole I, the whole conceit with uh, Clandestine Anomaly uh, was I wanted to make the player like the actual person, not an avatar of you, have the adventure and have the experience. So it was your neighborhood being invaded. You were sort of got synced in through a mayday hail from a from an alien vessel that kind of hacked your phone and that sort of led you in. And it was about how individuals, uh, the, the title was clandestine and then anomaly and the game never really developed far enough or the series never was successful enough to like continue on with that thread. But the anomaly was you know, from the aliens' point of view, they thought that you were some kind of like special human. But the anomaly is honestly that there is like human goodness in there, and this this unpredictability that you can't necessarily be controlled because we have our own motives and our own rationale. Um, and so that that's what that story was about. I wanted to make something where you weren't just you weren't Master Chief, you were you, and let's tell an adventure that takes place in your neighborhood about you. Um, and yeah, and. I don't think, I don't think we we got there, but I hope to someday. I'm like, I couldn't say. Like, I mean, technology is hard to predict. You know, it's like, I mean, certainly augmented reality has its uses in a post Pokemon Go world, but mm -hmm. you know, I'm not sure how far the technology will progress. I was more speaking to the limits of my talents than necessarily the limits of the technology, though. I kind of think, like, people made paintings on rocks in caves, you know, <laughs> that still have evoke a feeling when you look at them. So it's like, it's somewhat, I, I'm not trying to blame the technology. I'm sort of saying, like, where I think it will be mass market enough to make it viable and profitable to bother doing a big, expensive project. But, um... You know, I'm sure there's somebody very creative out there who could do something with AR today that is really, really uh, mind-blowing, uh, you know. So it's it's kind of unfair to blame the technology sometimes, I think. And I, it was my choice to take on the technology, so. Right. And jumping off that, um, you know, we touched a bit about it there, but, um, you know, for your current title, uh, yes. you have selected VR as the medium of choice mm -hmm. and indeed the, the question that beckons is what about virtual reality um is so integral to the storytelling of the last taxi here well i suppose we'll see what you know people ultimately say in terms of if vr was integral to it it certainly which we could or could not get into up to you but it certainly had a lot of design ramifications to try to to try to make it in vr but um, for me and uh, my wife, it was about, uh, and her name's Danielle, uh, just so it's not like I'm my wife. Um, the, uh, it was about like making sure that the user felt in this different world. So the game is sort of like, and, and maybe, I don't know if now's a good time or a bad time, but it's sort of like all of the problems of society if we don't really do anything about it. Capitalism stays the same. Technology rambles on until humans can merge with it. There's, you know, 
collapse of society due to climate change. There's migration problems. All the there's you know you'll pick up terrorists in the game and you'll pick up billionaire automated taxi CEOs. Um, and it's an opportunity to see all those different perspectives. And and it doesn't really make us a, a judgment call about any of these concepts. It's they're all branching every single passenger. But I wanted the whole idea of that immersion where you're sitting there, you're confronting this, you live in this world. I, that's what I'm hoping to achieve. So that the, the moral questions of the game, uh, and there is sort of like branching multiple endings. I, I, you know, I don't know what the exact number is going to fall between, but it'll be somewhere between 10 and 30 different endings, probably like, you know, big, there's big branches about four or five, and then there's like permutations of those. But um, I, I want those choices to matter and they can matter in obviously games like Mass Effect, uh, or not matter, I guess, depending on your viewpoint. But I think the whole idea of making you feel like you live in this world because you're sort of embodied in it through VR hopefully makes those choices feel more important and more resonant. And we've done some university research. There's actually a paper going to be published in a virtual reality journal that talks about something called like moral residue. Like if you play a traditional game versus a VR game where you're asked to sort of deal with this drunk person at a bar and there's consequences which one has the longer tail in terms of the emotional residue on people. And uh, we at least found in that preliminary study that VR sort of had a longer half-life in terms of people's feelings towards the decisions that they made. Um, now, we'd already decided to make the game when we did that research. So, yeah, um, but, you know, that's what we're hoping for. We're hoping that it's this big world. It's uh, you know the actual environment overall. It's not an open world game, but is bigger than Grand Theft Auto V. There's a lot of detail, a lot of environmental storytelling, and we're just hoping that the VR makes the world feel like you're really in it. Versus again, an avatar. It's kind of similar to AR, but in AR it's about you in this world, and this is about you in that world. This this world where every problem that we think is hard now is harder because we don't do anything. It's sort of like what happens if we I mean, in, in the U.S. especially, you guys are sort of experiencing that with COVID of the whole, like, delay, ignore what happens. It usually means things get worse. So it's like taking all the problems and cranking them up to 11, and that's the world you inhabit. And uh, you have to find your way through it and ultimately make some pretty big decisions that affect the course of this, the, the city that you're in. I'm like, uh, yeah, that's quite a lot to pack into a VR game. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Not a game specifically, because how do I put this? This isn't the, my first rodeo with a taxi-based game of this nature. Like, yeah, some have come out since. I've been working on this for over four years, but uh, yeah, yeah. Neo Cab has come out since I uh, I had a Steam page. This was greenlit like three and a half, four years ago, and it was a totally different art style that actually looks more like. Uh, neo taxi than what we did today but it's not really about being a taxi driver it's about um it's about facing all these choices and a lot of the games are very simple in terms of what they're talking about like talking about automation or the gig economy we have 75 characters that are all fully voice acted with branching choices and you can have pretty severe consequences even for those characters based on how you interact with them and so it's not about trying to deal with one one issue necessarily, though there is an overarching story that has some bigger themes. It's about letting people sit for a moment with these different ideas. Um, and hopefully it's a broader swath of ideas. It's almost like each character is like its own mini story, essentially. I mean, um, uh, well, I hope that works out for you. you know, it's like, <laughs> I, I, I haven't played your game since it's not out not yet. Not ready, but... yeah. <laughs> It's yeah. big and it's uh, unwieldy to get it all together and working, but uh, it'll be uh, it'll be there sooner than later at this point. Right, and uh, is the difficulty of crafting this game or the reason why it's taken three four years because of the small size of the team, VR, a combination of factors? Uh, it's like a combination of factors. One of them is how games, small games like this, or small, I guess they're not, like there's way smaller games, obviously, but it's not a AAA game, um, are funded in Canada. Um, it's a bit of a, it can be a bit of a process. Like you make a prototype, 
you or you make just like pitch material and then you you submit it and it takes like six months to hear back and then it takes time to do that and then you finish that phase and then you ask for money for to develop it and then you ask for money to like complete it and all those things kind of slow it down now i'm not complaining because we're very fortunate i think that we are able to sort of do these big creative ambitious projects um without sort of like there there's a revenue share that's split with the funder but like they don't own any of my company i have pretty much creative control to do as i wish within certain limits um like you know i can't suddenly you know, make a racist game i wouldn't but i'm just saying like there's some limits um uh, so that's part of it part of it is um, I, I seem to, I mean, my AR game also took like three and a half, four years. I seem to just take a long time. I, I try to do, I, I, I'm hoping the next game I'm going to actually take a different approach because I struggle with, um, my appetite being bigger than my stomach in some way. So things take longer. Uh, then there's obviously, in, I mean, I probably would take forever. I would never finish it if there wasn't like the money element to things. I just would never finish anything. Um, because I'm always trying to make it better. But so there's that. Um, there is the VR component with this game a little bit like the taxi flies, but locomotion is difficult in, in, in VR. And in VR, like everything you touch, it's not just like you can press A and then you fire an animation and the flip switches. You have to make that uh, flip switch feel good in a variety of controllers. And there's not really any real weight, but you need you need to try to make that thing feel like it has weight. And so just creating like, you know, coffee or creating a, you know, we have a tractor beam in the game, like creating those things in ways that are fun, compelling, and like work in VR is a lot, is, is a huge challenge. And then we don't want people to get motion sick at all. I can't say like, it's, it's hard. You, like, you can't test on everybody, but we put a lot of effort into making this a very comfortable game despite you flying around. And then there is just, you know, how, how long it takes to write the big story and make all the environments with a small team. So it's kind of all of those things. Yeah, about what I expected. Uh, you know, it's like, I don't think I will ever hear the words, making a game was easy or easier than I thought it was. I, yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I mean, it's it's hard in a way, but it's like punishment you're willing to take because you're doing what you love. So I don't really have, like, so it's fine. You know, I wouldn't yeah. want to be working in an ER right now, you know, I would rather be doing this. So relative to other things, it's easy, but relative to, you know, you take on the hard challenges because that's what makes them interesting. Right, right. Um, that, that is a common refrain on our show um, since, you know, we tend to skew indie and, you know, people on this circuit tend to talk more about passion than um, high charts. Yes. You know, I mean, the, there is that element, but you know, such as the society that uh, we live in. Like, yeah, you need to pay enough attention to the pie chart to not drown. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but anyway, so why is this game called The Last Taxi? Um, well, because you're the last human driver on Earth, essentially. But, um, and I don't know, it just sort of encapsulates the core idea simply, like... I mean, there is more to the story than just you being a taxi driver, but essentially you're a taxi driver. You're the last one. It did start with that, that angle, like the premise started with that focus on, on automation. And we sort of just took on more, uh, ideas as we, as we went, but, um, you know, we didn't want this to be like, you're, you're almost last taxi. Like literally you you're buying like a defunct company. You, you're, you, you are a programmer who was automated and you don't know what else to do with your life. So you go and you, you buy this taxi from a guy who's about to liquidate his c company because he's getting, he's, he's bought tickets onto a rocket to an off world colony because the world is, is screwed up. Um, and you're in the last city as well. And it's sort of just, I suppose the, the last part is just the end of an era of humanity. Like, you know, it's kind of at this point where we either, you know, we need to embrace technology probably to survive, but we lose something in, in that embrace. Um, and there's certainly people who, who think we could survive by completely rejecting all of the technology. But um, that's sort of the, the core thing is just there, this era is ending, the, the, the era of kind of everything we know, but you're seeing it through the purview of a character who gets to meet 
all walks of life and experience that epoch change, that change in time uh, that will never get back um, from that point of view, essentially. So it's like right before the world becomes totally different than anything we can conceive. You push the, you know, you can't tell a story that we can't conceive because no one would understand it. But it's like that that edge point right before everything we recognize as humanity and everything we recognize as civilization is, for better or worse, there's not a judgment again, uh, is permanently altered. Right. And in terms of like the taxi, is this a classic taxi or is this Uber? Uh, it's more like a classic taxi. In fact, there's a... They're not really the enemies of the game, but there's like there's the adversary called Fuber, uh, which which is Fubar and Uber Uber uh, mixed together. Um, and I would presume that their business model, and they would tell you that their business model is ultimately to eliminate humans. So I mean, essentially, I guess there's one other piece to the the idea of it being a taxi driver, a human taxi driver, which is what is that? What what is even our indistinguishable trait? Like what what is ultimately valuable about us? And I think the game lands on it's a human connection. And we're all struggling with that human connection right now. We have to talk through computer screens, and so, some of us take to it well, and for some of us, it's maddening to, to be so separated. But it's that, like, it's not necessarily something that's tangible or important on some sort of, like, universal scale, it's, but it's important to us individually. And so, the, so it's actually like, a, yeah, it's a conversation game. There are, like sort of some uh, physics-based mechanics and stuff that, that you, you know, you do on the side, but it's mostly a conversation game, and it's because those conversations is really where I don't think, maybe, but I, I think, like, there'll always be something about talking to another human that is is unique, or seeing a human issue from a robot standpoint. Like, you talk to robots, too, that are totally baffled by us, or that you're baffled by them, or have just different outlooks, but it's sort of conversation is core to who we are. I mean, we're on a you know, we're, this whole thing, your show is built on conversation. So that to me is like a core essence of of humanity. Um, and that that's sort of why you chose a taxi driver. Uh, but yeah, I think I think like the it there's that anti-corporate, not anti-corporate, but like corporations, you know, are would replace us if they could. And so you're sort of a private firm. You're actually the owner of the individual taxi that you have. And so that's why it's not like, a gig economy thing. It's more like the traditional taxi because it's that bygone era. Yeah, I see what you're going for here. Like people have actual nostalgia for, you know, your yellow cabs. They're probably not going to have nostalgia for ride sharing. Like there's no iconography to be attached to that. There's that. And there's also just Uber will crush their, you know, they have no loyalty to the people that work for Uber. Uh, if Uber could automate the whole fleet and still keep their customers, they would do it. Um, and so in this era, that's what has happened. So there isn't an Uber you could work for. Fair enough. Like um, Now, in terms of like the VR immersion, um, is it uh, like all sitting down and um, know, moving levers and such, or like can you get out of the taxi as well? Uh, you can get out of the taxi, but it's like it's still seated. Uh, you have a workbench, you have like a, a bed uh, that you deal with a, a character that comes in to play later on. Uh, not sexual, it's not like that, but just like you know, like a companion character. Um, and uh, and so yeah, you always keep it seated. I mean, that's partly for accessibility. Uh, we wanted to make the game that would play well on the PlayStation at some point, and we wanted to make sure that um, like people have mobility issues. Uh, and so we, you know, I don't know, like personally for me, like the standing up of VR, it has its cool features. Beat Saber is really fun, but like I don't think it's, you know, when I want to sit down and relax that's kind of an, an encumbrance. If you've been on your feet all day and then you got to go and play your video game and be on your feet and get sweaty, like sometimes that's what you want, but sometimes it's not. So we wanted to make it accessible in terms of the controls, in terms of that it's a seated experience. Uh, and the seat experience allows it perhaps to be more cinematic. I mean, you have basically the taxi 
controlled through you know windows that you can sort of uh, utilize to to tell stories in a way as well. Um, you do have like tablets and stuff. There is that bit of a papers please element to the game. Um, papers please, job simulator, Mass Effect kind of rolled together. Um, but yeah, you don't you don't like get up and get out of your taxi and walk around. In fact, the way that we were able to make the world so big was and and have so many characters was through that confinement. But I I don't think I would have made it standing if I could. I mean, we had early on design discussions about making it a standing taxi because standing's more fun and or, or perceived as more fun. But uh, I don't know. I don't I don't really see it. I don't think I don't think standing is like required for a good VR experience. Mm. I suppose it depends on <clears throat> it depends on what you're aiming for. Like, um, I, I can't imagine that uh, Half Life Alex could have done anything less than standing room VR. Why not? You don't use your feet in that game. Why couldn't you just have the camera? There's settings in the game. There's accessibility settings. It, I played uh, because of what, where Valve wanted to take that game. Like, but I'm saying you can completely play that game seated, and it's the exact same experience. What do you gain from? From standing. There's a few times where you need to bend down and look around a corner or like find one of those little pickups. But like like you play all your first person shooters seated except for Half-Life, Alex, basically. Uh it, do you feel deprived because you're you're like you're right. most of your life you spend sitting. So the the you know the the idea on well, maybe not everybody, but a lot of people spend most of their lives sitting. The idea that standing is somehow required to sell a reality to me doesn't make any sense but like i played i played half-life like because i was like i don't want to stand so i said it i went into the accessibility settings i i did stand i do enjoy it standing but at the time i didn't want to stand and i changed it so that i could use it as if you're in a wheelchair and it just adjusts the camera to be you're in a seated position but it brings the camera down and as long as you can swivel and rotate and move your cursor and bend your back like you can do everything in that game seated so well, I, I think some of the diverse similitude is for like be seated while doing activities that are you're supposed to be seated for but again there's a lot of flexibility in that that i don't think is always recognized yeah Once well and it's yeah. also like you know if like half-life doesn't make you jump right but like um certainly connect games did right and i imagine that that became a barrier for some people to play those games is now, now suddenly you're tying your fantasy experience of getting to be this awesome killer with your real world physical capabilities and there's a place for that. I'm not saying those games can't exist. Like, I love Beat Saber. I love getting up, get sweaty in VR. It's like the only way I like to exercise other than going on a bike ride. Um, but I don't think it's required. And I think different experiences call for different things. Um, yeah. I couldn't tell you in that regard um, because, you know, the finer points of what Valve wants to do is, you know, Valve. But, uh, you know, it's like, you know, I, I understand the, the desire to keep things accessible as well, you know, especially since, you know, VR games, uh, because of all the equipment, um, have you know, the, the standing room experiences have a bigger barrier to entry because uh, they call this phenomenon like gorilla tiredness or whatever, you, you know, uh, swinging your body around. Uh, there's that, or there's just not everyone has the space they can dedicate to that. Right. Like, like um, we live in North America where our houses are bigger than anywhere else in the world. And right. some of us still struggle to find that space to make that experience. But literally, it's partly like PlayStation. Like people, PlayStation VR is not built on standing experiences. And you're, and ultimately, it's like you're in a taxi. And we, we sort of were at some point discussing even like what defines taxiness. Like, because at one point we had it set up like a theater where you were in the back and the characters were in the front, so you could watch it like theater. You could be more engaged because if they're behind you, it's harder to like fit, like make quote unquote eye contact. But then it was like it didn't feel like a taxi anymore. People wouldn't recognize it as a taxi. It's too weird. So um, you know, for our game at least, I mean, like, are they going to make a a Forza VR game where you stand? I don't know. That would seem, or or if you do, it would be some gimmick like now paint your taxi or paint your vehicle, get out stand up like well, why I mean, am i standing the reason i bring this up is because this isn't just a taxi this is a future taxi sure you know, you know it's like Event to the future is the rules can be whatever they need to be though right so um and in that regard you know 
I'm guessing the narrative is the central reason why it's not just, um, you know, dealing with, say, you know, you are a taxi driver and you're being crowded out by Lyft and such. Um, and, you know, you're a hover, you're, you're doing a hover taxi. You're Bruce Willis in the fifth element here. Yep. And you're, and your paper, like, and you can also like record people's things and send them off to the government, you know, uh, jails and prisons and things as well. Uh, you know, like the morality question is throughout all of it. Um, and like, even like, again, even in half-life you're standing and you, you, you sort of walk around, but you're limited. You literally can't walk everywhere. You have to work. So it's like, what are you mostly doing in that game? It's with your hands and your right. eyes, right? Um, to me, it's not necessarily a big thing if people want think future taxis have to be standing and they, the, you know, the other merits or of the game don't compel them, then I suppose that's fine. But I, I, I sort of have a hard time seeing VR become this super mass market thing if you can't get the, 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 the experiences that allow people to just kick back a bit and take the pressure off, you know? Um, that's m why most people's Netflix and chill, if Netflix required you to like do exercise, it would probably be less popular overall. Regardless of what Valve did or didn't do, like I think that they executed it very well. And I'm not against those games, I just don't think that there's like these hard rules that it, it can't be the case. I mean, that's a question in its own right because um, you know, physically intense experiences do have um, massive sales numbers behind them, depending on what we're talking about here. Like compared you know, to the PlayStation Four, they don't. I'm talking about Wii Sports or Wii Fit, that yeah. kind of thing. You know, those things definitely. You know, it's they're true. Not, they're not well, VR, happened, but they're the direct the predecessor of VR. You know, motion control definitely laid the stage for modern VR. Yeah. No, I, I, I take your point, but look at the Switch now. This right. is the evolution from that. And yeah, there was no, the Switch hasn't sold the Wii. But the people who bought the Wii weren't gamers. They weren't looking for these deep experiences. They were looking to laugh and pretend to bowl in their house. And right. it was successful at that. But like the attach rate on games on that console were worse than the Switch, even though the Switch has less units sold overall. And it's because Switch is flexible. Switch, you can do motion games, though I would contend probably do most people use the motion controls when it's optional, you know? Like, the, I think they'll do it if they're forced to, like in Mario Party, but, like, do people generally play the Pokemon game, like, liking that they threw it, or do they prefer to play it like it's a handheld, you know? I'm like, once again, it depends on what kind of motion controls we're talking about. In terms of um, old, you know, Wii era motion controls, the answer is no. If we're talking about gyro controls, gyro aiming, um, mm -hmm. the answer is yes, that seems to be preferred over using dual uh, analog sticks. So, if I mean, I would, I, I get what you're saying, but again, the top selling games every year do not seem to require those things, right? Like, like, the, like Sony is the number one selling system, it I mean, doesn't require VR, and its number one games are like. Call of Duty and things like that. I'm That's... Saying it's not a one size fits all situation. Definitely, definitely, definitely. Yeah. Uh, anyway, um, now, how long is a game of The Last Taxi going to last you? Uh, you know, both in terms of like how you know how long does the story unfold, and you know, like, are you is this a two hour experience? Is this an eight hour experience? Is this a thirty minute eight, deal? Eight to ten for one playthrough. If you uh, wanted to replay it because there is the multiple endings and there is, you know, every single passenger has has alternative uh, endings and dialogues, then it's more than that. Uh, there is probably going to be some element of uh, being able to acquire cash, not needing to take on passengers. If that makes it in the game, that would extend the playtime a bit. But, um, you know, essentially, uh, essentially we're looking at about eight to 10 hour game for a s single playthrough going through the whole story modes um every passenger is roughly three to five minutes in length um so and then you know there's about 75 passengers and then there's other things like paying the bills and other story elements that aren't counted in that uh story sequences that aren't counted in that um so yeah so i mean i don't know what half-life necessarily clocks in at but it's also a triple a game but i think for a narrative driven experience uh, yeah, on VR. 
10 hours doesn't seem too bad to me, but I mean, I, I'm making the thing, so I'm a little bit, a little bit biased. Right. I don't know, you tell me, does that seem like a, well, depends having, on the price point, but. Like um, stacking it against other VR developers we've had on the show, that is a exceedingly long time. Um, granted, um, uh, both in terms of, like ambition and uh, everything, like a lot of our VR developers are, you know, they have a lot of smaller experiences, let's say. Or yeah. also, this is this game is not designed to be like finished in one sitting, I imagine. So no, yeah, it, it's like you know, this is definitely a leap forward in terms of um, VR experiences for our show. Um, yeah. Yeah, so, and when you're making this, there was no, like, Half-Life was only announced recently. But even still, like, I don't think that's really, they're not commensurate experiences, but they did raise the bar in terms of art and stuff like that, for sure. Um, but, yeah, like, that's what we were trying, that's what we were attempting to do, is to 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 bring a, a, a big game that isn't just predicated on a short play time that isn't, and and to add some, some narrative depths, like, um, in terms of, you know the moral the moral questions of the game, the situations you're put into, and it and it's not like the currently the video and stuff you see it might seem like a dark game, but it's more like dark comedy. Like the characters are often very irreverent and funny. And I think when we do release our first first trailer, which I already have the like the voice acting for that, um, as I think it's funny. We'll see what other people think. But it's sort of like we also didn't want to be like here deal with all these depressing things to get away from your depressing life. It's sort of trying to deal with things in, you know, kind of like not, it's not Futurama in terms of being straight up comedy. There is like more darkness than that, but in terms of like those shows that really hit, they're able to deal with heady issues in a, you know, with characters that have a personality that make it not just like, you know, bleak. Uh, and there's even situations like there is sort of fanboys who they're just rich and they spend all their money becoming, using technology to become the characters that they admire. So it's not all like, you know, heavy themes. I talk about that a lot because that's like my focus. But uh, mm -hmm. my my wife was certainly critical in making this not just some some bleak, depressing uh, thing. Uh, there's some levity to the situation. Um, yeah, uh, we that's what we were hoping to do. We we're hoping to bring a you know a, a bigger experience, larger in scope, and uh, hopefully in art. Hitting the art at scope is challenging, but. Uh, and in playthrough, but I mean, that doesn't mean, you know, there's always that thing of like, I know polish matters a lot and I aim for big, but I can't not have polish. And that's sort of the, that's the phase of the game that we're getting into in terms of development is like, okay, we have the pieces. It's mostly built out now. How good can we make it before we run out of money? <laughs> um, is that a question that you uh, have seriously asked? I no, sure. It keeps me up all the time. I don't want to make something that's not good. And, and certainly trying to make something big makes it harder to make it good. As you see, even with AAA games that, not that we'll be in this situation, but like, you know, a launch as like buggy garbage sometimes. Like there's Assassin's Creed games that launched on Xbox One that like they didn't launch with polish. Um, you know, yeah. uh, if you make a small ex experience, it's very easy to make that one thing very, very good. Um, you know, there's like a fishing game that's pretty popular on this, uh, on like VR platforms. And f we have like our tractor beam mechanic is also a fishing mechanic. And that's like one thing that's optional in our game. And so to do all that and hit this scope and make it good, like I'm, I hope it's great. I'm not the kind of person that's going to come, like I, I don't do interviews and like pretend like I've made something awesome. I hope I've made something awesome and I'm putting every single piece of my soul into this to try to make it awesome but ultimately we will find out when it when it ships and and as it gets closer i'll be more likely you know it'll get better as it gets closer but uh i mean you're always there's always trade-offs in game development and anybody who acts like there isn't is a liar or delusional um you know we tried to make something big and we have a small team and there's cost to that but i like but we have the time still to make it polished i do believe it will still be polished uh, all I'm saying is those small experiences that are one or two hours, what makes them awesome is they were small so they could be made good. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Why Nintendo is so great is because they can continue, not always, but they, at least with their flagship titles, they always hit that polish regardless. And uh, 
and that is something that I would say is actually rare amongst triple a devs is to release it to that that level but that's what you hope you hope that it's a flawless big awesome experience and that people are only complaining about i don't know something something small right right so we are getting low on time here so just a couple more questions on our end um in terms of uh, computer platforms, that you, uh, is this game Windows only, or are there, is there a Mac and Linux build as well? I don't know that there's a Mac that can run VR yet, really. Uh -huh. if, if So, I mean, when that happens, we will be willing to go there. We're launching first on uh, PC, and then we're actually focused after that uh, based on the sales on consoles. And... Uh, on actually a non-VR version of the VR game. Uh, but I mean, games have gone the other way. Skyrim has been made VR, so I don't think it's it's necessarily a bad thing to do, but PlayStation would be obviously like a huge target for us um, after the initial PC launch across like Windows Mixed Reality, everything. Like we're gonna hit all of the top end headsets. Um, and then it's hitting the lower end devices, hopefully, like the Quest and things like that, lower powered, not lower end. I actually, the Quest is the one I own. That's my favorite headset. Um, to use at home uh the uh and then and then you know we'll see like the linux user base is probably small but it's something that well it's definitely small but it's something that we've looked at and talked about and i know steam supports it so we would like it to be on everything ultimately right um but the roadmap is initially windows then to consoles makes sense um and has anything been worked out in terms of pricing uh, see, so there's been lots of debate about pricing, and we have a range, but my pricing is predicated on, um, you know, how I feel the final product is, and I feel like I'm, I'm, if I'm in the low end of my range or the high end of my range is dependent on, uh, you know, did I hit that polish level essentially, um, but I'm not, I'm not, I'm not uh, prepared to say even what those ranges are, but it's competitive priced um so even if the games are three hours and stuff like that we look at indie titles that are have the perceived quality and value and we price it against those essentially so it's not going to be it's like it's not going to be priced like half-life nowhere near that right it's going to be priced so, like so, so somewhere between five cents and 120 dollars <laughs> yeah somewhere above ten dollars and you know below forty dollars probably though i'm speaking in canadian so i don't you know, I don't know what it is American, but like less. Yeah, yeah, less. Actually, the oil has totally, uh, the oil price has totally screwed our dollar up. So <laughs> we'll see what happens with that. Right. Um, anyway, I'll see if my colleagues here have any final questions for you. I think I'm good. I am good. I think I'm good. All right, then. Um, well, once again, it was uh, lovely having you on our program. Um, Thanks for me. You know, and thank you for talking about your uh, space taxi game here. Or, uh, sorry, last taxi. I'm <laughs> thinking of something else there. Ah, that's okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, anyway, uh, the game is The Last Taxi. Uh, it is coming out, uh, I think, a range of what, summer 2020? Um, It'll be out by the end of summer for sure. It yeah. has to be. So, yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, um, I think you can green, uh, you can um, wish list this on Steam right now? I believe so. Okay. If not, uh, that's coming very, very soon. Okay. So, um, yeah. Keep an eye out for it when it releases, uh, you know, this summer. Betty, play us to the next segment. Right. Welcome to the topic of discussion. Uh, this week, well, we have actual news to talk about. Because, um, <laughs> well, I mean, there were a few things that popped up. Um, you know, there's another big rumor floating out there about Mario. Um, uh, Epic Games started a publishing division. But, uh, you know, the big news from the past week was, you know, Nintendo uploaded a direct mini on last Thursday. And 
you know, a lot of announcements, but I can also see why this was a direct mini. I can't say there was anything, you know, you know too substantial. You know, there wasn't just like, you know, here's Nintendo's fall lineup for, yeah. the, you know, a kind of deal. Like, arguably the biggest news that came out of the direct was the announcement that they have selected the franchise from which the next um, Smash character will be drawn from. You know, we don't know the fighter uh, yet, mainly because uh, development seems to have been hit by the coronavirus. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't know if you've noticed the theme of this show, but the coronavirus is kind of affecting society. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it's arms, which means probably... Ribbon Girl, Max Brass, uh, Twintel. My money would be on Twintel, and I'll yeah, tell you, I'll because uh, you know a lot a big reason why people weren't selecting Arms was because arm stuff has already arrived in Smash. Yeah, there are Me Fighter costumes for yeah. Spring Man and Ribbon Girl, and Spring Man is an assist trophy fighter. Right. So by which by and I say assist trophy fighter, but it's one of the it's an assist trophy, but it's one of the assist trophies that does like more complicated stuff and can be knocked out. Yeah. Usually by the rules of Smash, you go with the the quote unquote face of the franchise or the company or whatever. Um in this case that would be, you know, Springman. He's considered to be the mascot. If not him, then Ribbon Girl. She sung the fucking theme song for you know, but they're both already in Smash, technically. Um, the you thing know, yeah. about costumes, it doesn't necessarily preclude them, preclude them from being a fighter. It's only assist but trophies. Assist. That's true. Yeah. Okay, yeah. okay. Other possibilities: Ninjara and Min Min. They're probably not going to go with Master Mummy or Mechanic because they're too freaking big. Uh, oh, Kid no. Cobra and Helix uh, have very little charisma. Bite and Bark would probably be too complicated, but they do have other secondary characters. Right. Uh, all of North America is terrified of Lola Pop. Uh, Springtron is literally just a robot spring man. And uh, Misango, it could be Dr. Coyle. She's like the villain, I think. But uh, I, I don't think it would be one of the post-release characters. Yeah, like I said, if I had to plunk down money, it would probably be Twintel because, I, mm -hmm. I you know... Uh, Quintel is the one who, when she was revealed, she was so popular immediately that she got uh, put into the early access demo when she was not originally going to be. <laughs> right. Uh, you know, it's like, <laughs> look, having a finely sculpted ass goes a long way. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus. Look, are we are we going to deny why she was popular? No, no, no. It's no. kind of hard not. It's kind of hard to, yeah. Yeah, you know, it's like. Let's uh, you know. Let's be honest with ourselves as to why she shot up the popularity ranks. You know, so um, yeah, that would be my pick. Like, you know, maybe they would subvert the rules and put uh, put Springman in as a full fighter. Um, and if they do shadow that uh, shadow those rules, that means yes, Shadow will become a contender again. Oh God! And and Waluigi, uh, which is why they shouldn't do that. Yeah, because the the fervor would probably be nuclear. <sighs> yeah, you're not wrong. <laughs> but yeah, um, if I'm recalling, they're trying to aim for June for uh, Smash Character Six here. Mm -hmm. uh, I think so. So yeah, June. Yeah. You know, considering how the coronavirus is affecting everything, that could get pushed back. Mm -hmm. uh, anyway, um, so outside of that, the big showcase game from Nintendo on this Direct was Xenoblade Chronicles, the Definitive Edition. Um, they showed off a few other things in significant capacity, but yeah. I, I, I know. They, I they know. showed off a good chunk of Bravely, Bravely Default 2. Square Enix's game, though. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm like... Um, I, I guess you could technically call this Nintendo because they're probably going to publish it internationally like they did with uh, a lot of other Square Enix titles. But, you know, it's a Square Enix title. Xenoblade Chronicles is a Nintendo title. 
Um, though arguably not the biggest title there um, in terms of notoriety and especially sales. But you know, get to that in a bit. You know, they um, gave us no Nate for the Panzer Dragoon thing, right? Panzer Dragoon's out, but once again, uh -huh. we'll get to it when we get to it. You know, Xenoblade Chronicles got the release date. Um, it's going to have a new epilogue chapter dubbed Future Connect that stars Mela and Shulk. Um, I'll be honest, I don't know a lot about Xenoblade Chronicles because, honestly, my mind just kind of tuned out whenever Mac talked about it. <laughs> hey, it was the only way I could survive those conversations. <laughs> yeah. You know, and I'm sure if Mac were here right now, he would be able to tell us in excruciating detail, you know, just what got changed in terms of the art style. I, I do uh, like um, that's probably the biggest change here. It's not just it's an uptick in resolution. The art now looks a lot like Xenoblade Chronicles uh, 2. You know, mm -hmm. j just thankfully that the art direction didn't go that way either. Look, I am still one of those people who thinks. Xenoblade Chronicles 2 art direction is absolute shit. Mm. But uh, anyway, um, and they also announced that the Xenoblade Chronicles is going to have the predictably um, oversized uh, de you know, um, collector's edition, mainly because it's going to have a huge-ass art book. Yep, 250 yep. pages. Damn. Yep. Which they did for uh, Xenoblade Chronicles X as well. Right. Don't think did they do that for two? Probably, but I don't get that one. I don't think. Mm. Anyway, um, yeah, that was our headliner. But uh, the other Nintendo title that got announced uh, on this, or um, uh, Clubhouse Games, uh, what was it? Uh, Fifty One Worldwide Classics. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, um, Which, uh, if you like board games, it's a frack ton of board games, <laughs> right? Um, so if you don't recall back in the day, Nintendo had this lineup called touch generations, you know, that's where they stacked a whole bunch of their classic, uh, um, classic, um, you know, casual games, not even necessarily touch games because the line got extended to, uh, Wii games and touch wasn't really that thing's gimmick. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it was just kind of a branding exercise after a little bit. And anyway, the original Clubhouse Games was um, what, you know, was one of the titles that was released under that. And it was a fairly popular game um, or a game compilation. Because, yeah, Clubhouse Games is a compilation of a whole bunch of public domain uh you know, game types, just not always using the name that they're most known for. Like, mm -hmm. um, Yacht Dice is Yahtzee, for example, but they can't use Yahtzee. And yeah, they, they have to use non brand name versions of several. Yeah. Like, um, I'm, I forget what they're call what they're calling Othello in this, but they can't use Othello because that's an actual brand name for this game. It's usually called Reversi. But they're, they're using something else for it. And, um, yeah, they, they've got 51 games. Uh, granted, not all of them could be played at a clubhouse, or you're going to the country clubhouse. <laughs> like, like, you know, if, you've got a, if you're playing in a clubhouse that has a bowling alley, you know, let's face it, you're probably uh, pitching in some green fees as well. <laughs> mm -hmm. And this is coming June 5th. Uh, once again, um, Clubhouse game probably has the potential of being a bigger hit, a bigger sales hit than Xenoblade Chronicles, simply because of you know where the two games skew. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's like Clubhouse game is very casual focused. You know, and it's actually good to see something like this here because um, mm -hmm. honestly, there's not that many casual games on the Switch. It's kind of surprising. Mm -hmm. You know. It is. But, you know, and especially considering, you know, one, two switch ring fit adventures, maybe they don't fit quite as well into the switch idiom, but they still are doing gangbusters in terms of sales. So, you know, people like the Nintendo casual stuff. Um, and, you know, you know, if this game has a physical release, uh, you know, it's 
I'm not sure if that's been established yet. But my point is, I wouldn't be surprised if Clubhouse Games outsold Xenoblade just because of where things lie. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, other, um, those were like the showcase. There were other updates. Um, Ring Fit Adventure has a new rhythm mode, which what, I have not tried out yet, but I want to. Yeah. Um, which has songs from Super Mario Odyssey, Splatoon 2, and more. And oh, uh, also the Ring Kong has uh, the Ring Con has a female voice option. Yeah, they get they d added multiple languages, and your character could always be male or female, but Ring was always male. The Ring Con is basically a character in the game, so they made it so that that could be female. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see, Animal Crossing: New Horizons will get their first seasonal event um, starting today, April first. Uh, when we are recording this. It feels um, weird that they're DLC now, though. <laughs> I mean, they're free, but yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, that's... it's basic, Well, they're doing that with the event Pokemon, too. It's it's just well, now that they can do that, they don't have to program in all the holiday stuff ahead of time. And if they don't program it all ahead of time, then people can't get it early by setting their system clock early. Mm. Yeah. Um, yeah, welcome to the era of the live service game. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And yeah, this event is, they're not calling it Easter, but it's an Easter event. Mm. Yeah, Bunny Day. I mm -hmm. mean, practically all of the holidays have uh, off-brand names. Right. Um, uh, another Nintendo game that was announced and is out now, but I don't think people picked up that it was a Nintendo game, because it, um, it doesn't have the traditional Nintendo game look or whatever. You know, it's called Good Job. Um, it's, an environmental, it's an environmental puzzle game starring those uh, like abstract men from the men's room pictures, I guess. Like, yeah, that I, was a bit of an odd one. Yeah, yeah. Like, not sure who developed this, um, but uh. it's certainly a curiosity. Uh, let's see, Marvel Ultimate Alliance Three got its latest uh, DLC expansion. And it's Fantastic Four themed. And as you might expect, you're uh, fighting Doctor Doom. Shock and like, horror. Yeah. <laughs> Still, it's, it's nice to see the Fantastic Four back because um, they were kind of excised from everything Marvel for a little while because they were being petulant assholes because, oh, we don't have the film rights. Yeah, because someone else had the movie rights, yeah. Yeah, but, you know, since they now own the company that owned that... Um, it's no longer a problem. <laughs> Never let it be said that massive corporate mergers don't have their upsides. You know, however slim they may be. Anyway, uh, let's see. 2K Games announced a bunch of uh, stuff, a bunch of ports to the Nintendo Switch. So, um, I know people have been waiting for some of these, like the Bioshock Collection, the mm -hmm. Borderlands Legendary Collection, and the XCOM 2 Collection. Um and, yeah, it's like the Bioshock collection is um, all of the Bioshock games and their DLC. Um, the Legendary Collections is the first three Borderland games. Um, that includes the pre-sequel, not Borderlands 3. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, you know, the, fir the first three technical Borderlands games were all done for the Xbox 360 era. Um, let's see. And the X... And um, that's also with all their DLC. Um, and the XCOM 2 collection is going to be the base game, the World of the Chosen expansion, and four DLC packs. Presumably this is because all of the XCOM 2 DLC isn't out yet. Um, also worth noting that the, you know these games are going, are going to be fucking huge because um, they, are put, they are putting like three HD games on these carts or you know they're not actually doing that but you get the idea like, like they're doing it in weird ways because the bioshock collection all three games beginnings are going to be stuck on there and you have to download the rest while the borderlands collection is a bit more traditional the first game is on that and you have to download everything else like you know people are just not ponying up for the 32 bit uh, 32 gig cards mm -hmm. or whatever you know um, because you can just download that shit. And it's also why um, going physical doesn't mean shit in these days. 
because um, unless you're like buying an indie title, because you know <laughs> you don't get all of the game on there, your. There are still some games that have all of their stuff. Right. I'm just saying that this is more and more a thing in our modern age. Mm-hmm. You know, so you know it's a bit frustrating, but you know what can you do? Uh, anyway, let's see. Um, mobile game Shin uh, Shikashai Into the Depths uh, hit the Nintendo Switch. Um, pre uh, that was a debut title for the Apple Arcade. You know, it's the second such title that uh, has done that in as many days or weeks. You know, whenever the last AD Direct was, which was not too long ago, that had Exit the Gungeon as its uh, closer, which was also a game that appeared on the Apple Arcade first. Yeah. Um, honestly, don't know too much about this because, you know, it was stuck on the Apple Arcade. Like, uh, let's see. Um, speaking of ports... Um, Catherine Full Body is heading to the Nintendo Switch. Um, fuck you, Atlas. That's all I got to say to that. No, seriously. Uh, until they start with the transphobia and the you know homophobia, fuck them. Uh, King's Bounty Two has been announced, which is a long series of games. Um, it's a uh, Apparently, a uh, you know a long line of tactical RPG games. I, yeah, I don't know too much about this one. Um, let's see. As mentioned before, a long, detailed look at Bravely Default Two, um, which is doing the you know um, I'm not sure if it's doing. Uh, I'm not sure what the Bravely Default connection is outside of the battle system. You know, because it's got the Bravely and it's got the Default. But, yeah, I think well, Bravely Second was an actual plot sequel to the first Bravely Default. Right. So this could be just like a Final Fantasy thing if it's a new game that uses a, the same. I, I, I guess I, I just hate titles like this. You know, you're you're calling this Bravely Default Two, um, even though it's not the fucking second game. See also Xenoblade Chronicles Two. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's actual. You know, it's like it's. Look, I like. Shit so, well, sometimes it's like they want to do like a do like a take back season, take a mulligan on doing the doing a sequel. But yeah, I get what you mean. Yeah. Uh, anyway, uh, Ninjala. I mean, I, there might be more of a connection in Bravely Default too. I didn't play the first one enough to like recognize it. So fair enough. Uh, let's see. Um, Ninjala uh, has a new release date. If you recall, this is the um Splatoon and in- Yeah, it's it's third party melee Splatoon with ninjas. Yeah. Um and bubblegum apparently. Ninja bubblegum. That is a thing in this game. Like yep. um worth noting it's going to be free to play when it launches on March twenty seventh. Uh let's see. Uh in ancient uh let's see ancient Star Wars game, Jedi Knight Jedi Academy hit the Nintendo Switch uh like right after the direct. And they also announced that episode one racer, um, which was, if I recall com- correctly, surprisingly good. And the switch is going to be great for the uh, secret uh, two controller mode. Mm. <laughs> yeah. And as mentioned elsewhere, um, the Panzer Dragoon remake is out on the Nintendo switch. Now um, from what I'm hearing, don't buy it. Like, um, mm. Oh, is it not good? Uh, the frame rate. Ah. It's uh, ah. okay. So the trailer that they showed at the uh, that the uh, at the direct was sixty frames per second. The actual game is thirty. Hey. Like, huh? I'm like, yeah. That tells you that the uh, footage that they were showing was from the PC version. I'm like, yeah. I've heard that there are other problems, but I definitely heard about the frame rate. Like. Um, yeah, so just on that alone, wait for the PC version. Or until they patch it to 60 frames per second. If they can. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's like, and yeah, I know that the original Panzer Dragoon game was less than 30 FPSs. We're not in 1990 fucking 5 anymore. You know, we don't have to deal with frame rates such a, you know, we don't have to deal with the 20 FPS frame rate that that generation gave us 
Ugh. Anyway, um, Trials of Mana got its release date of April 24th. Oddly and enough, this is... Co- yeah, uh, yeah, and a demo. Oddly enough, this is coming out after the Final Fantasy VII remake. I, I, granted, I know that the Final Fantasy VII remake is stuck on the PlayStation 4 only, and this is coming to the PlayStation 4, Nintendo Switch, and the uh, Steam service. You know, mm-hmm. so you know it's a bit more accessible. Yeah, I, already, I already pre-ordered it because I'm sure I won't be able to pick it up in person, so might as well. Mm. Yeah, and it looks a lot better than the um, Secret of Mana remake. I, mm-hmm. I you know heard that wasn't bad, but you know that just looked so. You know, you were do, developing this for the uh, for the fucking Vita. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the Secret of Mana remake had some issues involving style and stuff. So, you know, I, you know, it's like you can tell that this didn't have a Final Fantasy VII remake budget, but it had a bigger budget than whatever they allocated to, you know, the previous uh, remake. They're they're actually uh, adding um, some things, I believe. Like like they're adding a new tier of uh, class changes and. I think there was something else, but I can't remember. So it's not just it's not just a re-release with a new art style that's available on newer systems. They're actually trying to improve it too. Mm-hmm. And let me see. Uh, I think there was a whole yeah, there was a whirlwind of smaller announcements. Um, oh right, um, the the direct mini concluded with a new look at um, Sword and Shield's expansion passes, um, which is mostly just. Uh, clarifying a couple of things that people didn't weren't sure about about the first one but also a little bit more detail yeah and a uh, whole bunch of like um reveals and release dates like burnout paradise remastered is coming to the nintendo switch god damn it um, EA, just make a new burnout game <laughs> do you really want them to make a new burnout game with you know their current mentality as it's long as if they do it like Need for Speed Heat, that's fine because that they've left their BS out of that one. But you know, I'm just saying, you know, they might get the live service bug. Um. Anyway, um. Also, uh, Saints Row Four Reelected got a release date of March 27th. Um. If it's anything like the Saints Row Three port, don't buy it. Um. Legit, like one of the worst ports on the Nintendo Switch. Um. Le- the Legend of Heroes Trails of the Cold Steel 3 got announced, which is interesting because the uh, I don't think the other Cold Steel games are on the Switch. Um, let's see. Vigor got a closed beta announcement of April 9th. Um, Fuser, that, that new Harmonix game, Autumn 2020. Uh, Elder Scrolls Blades for Spring 2020. Does anyone seriously care about this? <laughs> you know, oh, oh boy, I can't wait to play a mobile Elder Scrolls great uh, game on my Switch. You know. Anyway, um, one of the best announcements to the Nintendo Switch, and something that is not being talked about en- enough, but that's probably because um, we didn't get Mr. Driller Drill Land, like. Mr. Driller Drill Land is one of the best GameCube games you never fucking played. Um, best Mr. Driller game um, by a country mile. And I don't know why Namco left it back in Japan. Um, maybe it's just because of the you know the failure of Mr. Driller in general to gain traction in the West. But they're rectifying it. Um, uh, Mr. Driller Drill Land is coming out June 25th. Um, hopefully it comes to other platforms there. Um, and the final one was Minecraft Dungeons got a release date of spring 2020. I think it just got a proper release date uh, announced like yesterday or today. Although if it was today, don't, you know, it's hard to trust things on April Fool's Day. Mm -hmm. Indeed. And yeah, so that was the breadth and scope of the Nintendo uh, direct mini as you can see there was a lot announced there it's just what you know what was there was mostly stuff that was already announced 
or um, you know, was it stuff that you would build a direct around? You know, it, it's like, look, I understand that the Bioshock series are uh, high selling, you know, um, very important games, but you know, they're also pretty old by now. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, anyway, um, so yeah, that'll about do it for this installment of Fragments of Silicon. Um, you know, if you enjoyed our broadcast, um, consider hitting the notification buttons lightly so you don't break your screen. <laughs> I'm still going to mock that call to action for as long as possible. Yeah, yeah, you're you're not alone in this. You know, Indeed. Just some of the like violent adjective that subscribe button. You'll fucking destroy some screens, dude. <laughs> like punching the subscribe button doesn't subscribe it breaks your monitor <laughs> or your phone screen like, or both yeah Jeez. anyway um the week ahead so um yeah we do have a friday show um coming on april 3rd is madison williams of zweihander uh yeah as you can they're a german company um we'll be talking about a game called captain contraband which i think is a twin stick shooter um, and yeah, I'm looking forward to that. And let's see on the Sunday reviews, um, we'll be having reviews of hypergalactic psychic table tennis, 3000. Um, that is a long way to say that this game is a take on pong. Um, not a pong clone. It, it is like a pong RPG thing, um, with a parody element to it. Um, you know, it's close. It's a lot closer to to that recently announced Pong Quest game than you think. I'm like, and yeah, hmm. Pong Quest is a thing. I got PR about that. I still don't want Atari back on my show. Like, anyway, um, they know what they did. Like, and if they didn't, uh, I know what they did. Uh, anyway, um, Petty Fan will be reviewing Artificial Extinction, a um. First person tower defense game, basically, or sentry defense, or whatever. Oh boy, that is. sounds like a good combination. It's not as if tower defense games usually require a great deal of situational awareness and the ability to monitor the whole, uh, you know, arena at once. I mean, Sanctum was pretty good. Yeah, like I think that video still exists too. You know, with uh, me and the old crew going through Sanctum. It was one of Naka's uh, Let's Try or whatever series. Anyway, I'm not saying it uh, can't be good. I'm just saying it's a, it's, it's a rough. I, I, I know. I know. I'm like, um, In Other Waters, which is a unique narrative driven game. I'm honestly not sure how to classify this in terms of, of a genre because um, I'm guiding the game through like a, a submarine. Interface, I guess, is a good way of calling it. You know, like, I, I, I've never controlled a game quite like this. You know, um, granted, I never played the Silent Steel games. It, it It's unique, if nothing else. You know, um, and we got Super Destronaut Land Wars for the Nintendo Switch, which is, uh, you know, a Galix cover, a uh, Galix review. Um, and yeah, he gets to play the Space Invaders FPS game. Yeah, I don't get it. I'm sure more on that uh, more on that on Sunday. So until then, until Friday, sorry, um, I shall wish you good gaming.